When it comes to games that really capture the era that they released in, almost no game comes close to Jet Grind Radio! or Jet Set Radio, as it's known pretty much anywhere except North America. Released in 2000 for the Sega Dreamcast, this game is a fascinating time capsule into this era through its aesthetics, its influences, its structure, and even in some of its shortcomings. Jet Set Radio is one of those series that is firmly rooted in the time period that it was released in, but somehow it also feels ahead of its time, and it is absolutely worth remembering. Jet Set Radio was developed by a studio named Smilebit and published by Sega, and what's unique about this game's team was that it was a small team comprised of young, budding developers. Smilebit was a Sega studio that was formed for members of Team Andromeda, the team responsible for the Panzer Dragoon games on the Sega Saturn. This team was rather small, consisting of fewer than 25 developers, with their average age being under 25. In an interview with Games TM, the game's director, Masayoshi Kikuchi, stated that this team wanted to create something fresh, contemporary, and noticeably different from their previous work. We wanted to work on something that was completely unlike Panzer Dragoon saga. Something dealing with pop culture and something that was cool. The fresh perspective and desire to create something distinct and culturally relevant is very apparent in Jet Set Radio, right from the moment that you boot the game up and witness the game's iconic aesthetics. Jet Set Radio was one of the first games to use a cel-shaded art style, which gives it its bright and distinct look that has aged really well over time. Now, it's worth noting that Jet Set Radio received an HD remaster on Steam that looks really great, but for this video I'm playing the Dreamcast original because I want to show you just how well this original version and its art style have held up over time. Its graphical style was incredibly distinct and fresh for the time, and while cel-shading graphics would become a bit controversial a few years down the line, being seen as too cartoony and childlike, when looking back on it today, I think it's easy to say that Jet Set Radio's style and personality has aged incredibly well, as a time capsule into this new and interesting art style as it was budding. The thick outlines on the characters make them pop when contrasted to the vibrant and lively city settings that you skate through. The designs of the incredibly diverse cast of characters are chock full of personality and energy, which is reflected in the fact that these characters never stop moving, even on the character select screen. The characters can always be seen dancing to the music or moving around, even when they're trying to have a serious conversation, which is kind of goofy, but also perfectly appropriate for this game's tone. It would be remiss of me to not talk about the music as well, which is arguably one of the aspects of Jet Set Radio that has defined its legacy. Most of the soundtrack to this game was composed by Hideki Naganuma, a DJ who'd go on to create music for games like Sonic Rush and Lethal League, but there are also a good amount of licensed tracks from other artists as well. The soundtrack to Jet Set Radio is is eclectic, energetic, and most of all, funky. The soundtrack is so sonically diverse, incorporating elements of hip-hop, acid jazz, dance music, and even some metal in there. The music to this game is timeless, but it also, ironically, is firmly rooted in the era that it was created in, giving it an instantly nostalgic feel even if you did not grow up with this game or in its time period. Hideki Naganuma's creative usage of samples pays wonderful homage to the very genres that inspire Jet Set Radio's music, but the music to this game has even gone on to inspire other games music more directly. What? What? I don't understand what's going on here. The soundtrack to this game absolutely deserves all of the accolades and legacy that it has built over the years. It really is that good. The story to Jet Set Radio has a lot of personality, but overall it's relatively serviceable. It starts off as a simple turf war amidst cartoony graffiti gangs where you're also trying to dodge a militant police force that wants you dead by any means necessary. And I mean any means necessary. They'll shoot at you, employ tear gas, roll in tanks, and bring in helicopters all to stop a single single person from spraying an S on a wall. The captain of the police, Onishima, is an exceptionally cartoonishly evil villain. I mean, just listen to him over the police intercom. This is Onishima! I'm sending in the parachute squad! Once again, fill that hell on wheels with lead! 
Oh my god! <laughs> However, as the game goes on, it shifts from a light-hearted tug-of-war between goofy gangs to a struggle with an oligarch hell-bent on total domination by obtaining a record apparently made by a mad music producer, which is a hilarious concept. The story is fine. It's not a particularly memorable or deep story, but it conveys the game's anti-establishment themes in a very extravagant, yet light-hearted way. And a huge part of that is DJ Professor K. Tokyo's very own number one pirate power station, Jet Set Radio! He's a pirate radio host that is responsible for creating all of the mixes of music that you hear throughout the game, and he also gives you the bits of story in between each level as you play. His character is just so well done, from his great sense of humor. A letter from Mr. Osaki asks, How do I get rid of these nasty roaches? Easy, just burn your house down! We got another letter from Osaki. He says, I burned my house down. What should I do now? How should I know, fool? To even little details like the way his microphone clips as he talks, giving a sense of authenticity to his character that really sells him as a radio host narrating everything that happens as you play. He's probably the only character that gets a very defined personality in this game, because the rest of the cast doesn't talk too much or differentiate themselves, which is a bit of a missed opportunity, but honestly, it's fine because they're more or less silent while you play through most of the game anyways. So you've probably noticed that we've talked a lot about aesthetics and music, but very little about how this video game actually plays. Jet Set Radio was praised rather heavily in its heyday for having intuitive controls and exciting balanced gameplay. However, when its HD re-release came around, the same outlets that praised the original release's gameplay lambasted the re-release, describing its controls as sluggish and its overall gameplay as a test of endurance. It has been almost 23 years since the game's original release, so it is very likely that this game has aged a bit since then, but has it? Well, yes, I do think that Jet Set Radio can show its age in some areas. Overall, I think that this game is still fun to play today. Jet Set Radio's gameplay is an interesting amalgamation of different video game genres at the time. It's kind of an extreme sports game, like Tony Hawk Pro Skater. However, here, things like grinds are done automatically, and tricks are much simpler and less of the focus. It's also kind of a platformer, where you're trying to get to certain objective points, but instead of just making jumps, your goal is to link rails and tricks together. In most levels, there are a set number of targets where you'll need to find an opposing gang's graffiti and spray paint over it while avoiding police and corporate aggressors. You have to find all of them within the time limit and also avoid your health from dropping to zero, or else you'll have to restart the level again. Spraying graffiti is simple, just pull the left trigger and sometimes make some quick inputs for larger pieces. The small tags are relatively easy to clear, your progress won't be halted at all and you can keep your momentum up, but for the larger pieces, you'll have to stop dead in your tracks to put in some inputs, which gives the enemies a lot of time and opportunity to catch up to you and do damage. These larger tags are a bit of a controversial mechanic for this game, since Jet Set Radio is pretty much always inspiring you to go fast and pretty much never stop moving. The faster you go, the more air you can get, the more places you can get to where enemies can't get to you, and this makes Jet Set Radio a fast, challenging, and rewarding experience. Pulling off multiple grinds, jumps, and wall rides to maintain your speed is difficult, the characters feel rather weighty, and there are lots of obstacles in your way to try to stop you from achieving that flow, but with some practice, you can start to nail jumps more frequently, and man, let me tell you, it's one of the most satisfying gameplay loops as you start to enter these flow states. However, back to those larger tags, they do somewhat break that pace by stopping you entirely to perform some inputs. And while that is a bit disappointing, I also think that they add an element of risk and reward to the gameplay that prevents you from just walking up slowly and tagging a spot. This way, you have to move quickly to shake any danger off of your tail so that when you get to that vulnerable position when you're tagging a larger piece, you've got way more time to finish the graffiti and leave without so much as a scratch from your enemies rather than having to abuse iframes and tank damage to get a single piece done. After covering all of the graffiti, you'll receive a ranking based on your performance, remaining amount of health, spray cans, and time left. I really like this ranking system since it provides a lot of incentive to replay levels over and over and master them, linking tricks together, minimizing damage 
damage taken and finishing graffiti murals are all crucial to getting that coveted jet rank, and I personally find these rankings really satisfying to get. The ranking system gives that classic arcadey feel that wants you to replay its levels over and over again to try out different methods to achieve a higher score, which is something I personally love in games from this era. You've probably noticed in the gameplay that you're watching that I've been pretty much using a different character in every level. There is a huge cast of characters here, each with their own stats, but sadly these stats don't matter as much as you'd think they would. Each character has three stats, power, technique, and graffiti. Power is pretty simple, the more power a character has, the more health they have. Graffiti is also pretty simple, the higher a character's graffiti stat, the less cans of graffiti they can carry, but the more points they'll get for each graffiti tag because their inputs are more complex. Technique is the weird one, because the game's manual says that it affects your turning radius, but lots of chatter online seems to be convinced that it affects how many points you get for tricks, and it could be both. Regardless, I'll be honest, they kind of barely affect the gameplay much at all, especially for a casual playthrough. Most of these characters feel very similar, and you'll likely gravitate towards characters like Combo and Tab for your first playthrough since they have more health and can hold more graffiti cans, but on subsequent playthroughs you'll probably choose characters like Gum and Yo-Yo for their higher graffiti stats to achieve higher rankings. I like that these characters all have different stats, but honestly I wish that they played a bit differently and weren't different in mostly score and health points. If some characters maybe had a more floaty jump or a more forgiving grind magnetization, that would do wonders for beginners who may find this game's controls difficult to understand. In the spirit of Sega's marketing campaigns showcasing graffiti as an art form, there are also tons of unique pieces of art that you can equip for use in-game, and you can even create your own graffiti as well. I'm not much of an artist personally, and I'm definitely not much of an artist when equipped with only a Dreamcast control stick, but it's cool that you can add your own art pieces to the game. There's also tons of art to choose from here too, and you could even unlock more by finding these little emblems in each level, which are usually in hard to reach places and reward skilled platforming, which I really like. New Graffiti Art is a great cosmetic unlockable that is optional, but rewarding to find. The levels in Jet Set Radio are really interesting, both aesthetically and as playgrounds for its action sport mechanics. Most levels, especially in the first act, are really great playgrounds for you to run around and rack up speed and try to reach new places. Personally, I think the level design in Jet Set Radio is at its strongest in its first act, where you'll be given an intricate yet well-defined area to ride around and find graffiti spots in. They're usually pretty open with lots of rails and things to grind on, but it's easy to survey the landscape at a glance and know where you want to go next. The second act, which is comprised of two stages based on US cities that were actually added to make sure that Western players wouldn't feel alienated by the game's style and setting. And unfortunately for us, these are two of the weakest stages that this game has to offer. Bantam Street is relatively passable outside of some downright evil graffiti spots for new players, but Grind Square is easily the worst level in this game. Its very vertical level design doesn't quite work well with this game's mechanics because there aren't really many ways to to gain verticality while grinding without losing momentum. So instead, this level has elevators that you can just take to the top of the rooftops, and from there you'll precariously grind across rails that don't really give you the space to build up speed to make jumps, and one wrong move sends you careening to the bottom of the level to go ride the slow elevator all the way back up. This level definitely misses the point of what makes Jet Set Radio fun to master, and if your first playthrough of this game ended here, I really couldn't blame you. The third act does improve things though, reusing levels from the first act, but instead asking you to travel between levels in an area and clear out a ton of graffiti. This was really impressive for its time. Open-ended levels like this didn't really exist in games prior to Jet Set Radio. Although now, the tactics that the developers use to mask loading in different parts of the level stick out a lot more obviously now. These districts aren't really seamless and completely open-ended, instead there are a few bigger levels that are connected by long longer, linear tunnels that mask the loading the game is doing behind the scenes. Again, very impressive for its time, but by today's standards, these levels feel like a few standard levels connected by hamster tubes. Overall, I'd say that the level design in Jet Set Radio does a good job complementing the gameplay and does show a lot of promise, but it has rough edges that could have used some smoothing out. You won't only be running around painting graffiti murals though, there are also a few other mission types that you'll encounter throughout the game. One of these are 
tagging missions, where you'll pursue a few rivals and tag their backs to defeat them. These battles are theoretically an interesting take on a tailing mission, where you want to maintain your speed to keep up with the enemies and tag them quickly, but in practice, they wind up being really drab pace killers. They're not great tests of your speed because the range to tag them is so tight, but you can't bump into them even slightly because it will kill your momentum. And the graffiti tagging mechanics don't particularly make for deep boss battles, so instead you just wind up needing to memorize the enemy's movement path and mash L. The same button that also controls the camera, by the way, which does not make for a fun boss battle in the slightest. These tagging missions are really finicky, tedious challenges that do not put Jet Set Radio's mechanics in the best light. After you complete some levels, you may also get a challenge from a new character interested in joining the GGs. This challenge could be a Simon Says-esque task where the recruit will perform a set of maneuvers and you must mimic those maneuvers without missing a beat. This is fine, it's kind of goofy, and it's surprisingly restrictive. Like, you really have to do everything pretty much exactly how it's shown. It's cool that it can teach the player tech like wall riding, but there are definitely more interesting ways to challenge the player to learn new tech. One of these ways is through the other type of challenge, which is a race with the unlockable character to a designated point. Now, this is more like it, challenging the player to outpace their opponent through mastery of the game's mechanics and knowledge of the landscape. This is a great challenge, but unfortunately there is one key flaw. The game doesn't show you the route that you need to take, just the point that you need to get to. A highlighted trail, some indication of where you're supposed to go would have made these missions the ideal challenge that breaks up the traditional graffiti missions, but as they are, they're still really fun. Jet Set Radio is a diamond in the rough, a game that many people remember fondly for its aesthetics, but not necessarily for the way that it actually plays. It's remarkable that Smilebit were able to create a game here that pushed boundaries in lots of ways. Jet Set Radio is one of the first games credited to have a semi-open world and one of the first to utilize cel-shaded graphics, and those achievements are worth remembering. Jet Set Radio is, however, a bit rooted in its time period in the control department, and learning how this game works can be a bit of a tall order. That first playthrough of this game can feel clumsy, unforgiving, and slow-paced, but this game comes from an era where games were meant to be replayed over and over again, and Jet Set Radio is no exception. A single playthrough will only run you about 5 hours, and I totally understand that replaying games and trying to maximize ranks is not for everybody. However, if you're willing to give Jet Set Radio time to shine, I think that its mechanics shine brightest on those subsequent playthroughs where you start to earn those Jet ranks. Jet Set Radio is, in my opinion, a good game that is bogged down by some dated elements. But the sequel? Jet Set Radio Future is a little bit bigger, a little bit faster, a little bit edgier, and a little bit more polished than its predecessor, and it absolutely deserves to be remembered. Jet Set Radio Future was an exclusive on the original Xbox and is not really a direct sequel to the original Jet Set Radio. It's more like a reimagining that retreads a lot of the same ground as the original with a lot of the same characters, the story hits a lot of the same beats with the same antagonist, and even some of the level design shows similarities to the original game as well. Jet Set Radio Future takes takes these established beats and spins them in an entirely different direction, often expanding them with new dialogue between the GGs that showcases their personalities more. There's only one thing I hate more than dogs, and that's goldfish? <laughs> what? Combo, please clarify. What do you mean by that? He's not gonna clarify, is he? <laughs> and gives the story more space to breathe and develop naturally. However, I think the most stark difference between these two games is in the gameplay department. If you may have found Jet Set Radio's controls to be heavy, unforgiving, and stiff, Jet Set Radio Future completely overhauls the gameplay in the opposite direction, creating characters that are nimble, fast, and floaty. Mechanics like wall riding and grinding are so much more forgiving in this game as they're crucial for exploration and are significantly easier to get the hang of on a first playthrough. There's also a new boost, which 
will increase your speed dramatically for a few seconds at the cost of 10 paint cans, allowing players to gain an immediate burst of speed, whereas in the previous game, you really had to work to build and maintain even a fraction of the speed. In Jet Set Radio Future, your character is as floaty and speedy as a character in any 3D platforming game, and it's incredibly fun to jump around grinding on rails and boosting across large pits. Grinding on rails especially is a huge part of this game, even more so than in the original, and this makes it really easy to get around quickly and build up speed, and you won't be hitting those brick walls that stop your momentum entirely nearly as often as you might in the original. However, since the grinds are so forgiving, sometimes you may find yourself automatically grinding in a direction you don't want to go. And if this is the case, there's no way to get off without jumping and praying for the best, which can send you flying off of precarious ledges and set you back way more than you probably should be. Tagging graffiti spots has also been streamlined. Instead of halting your momentum entirely to input some control stick movements, Jet Set Radio Future makes tagging as simple as pulling the L trigger, even for larger pieces, which is a much appreciated change that keeps the game's pace and momentum going strong. This also makes tagging battles so much less disorienting and way more manageable, which is a breath of fresh air. Even though I am a defender of the risk and reward of Jet Set Radio's mural inputs, I must admit that tagging in future was a good change, especially for this game's focus on speed and agility. Another really great change is that the cast of characters feel noticeably different in the way that they fundamentally control, like their speed, cornering, and acceleration, rather than just in numerical values like health points. This is great because it lets players choose characters that fit their play style, rather than just choosing the character that looks the coolest or has the most health or can get the most graffiti points. You can even unlock these save points in each level and change characters on the fly, which is really cool and gives you plenty of opportunity to find the character and play style that works best for you. The structure of the gameplay here has also been changed from its predecessor. Instead of a level structure with time limits and ranks, Jet Set Radio Future instead opts for an open, interconnected world with areas that lead to other areas as you play. Doing away with the time limit in this structure was a good move, because now players are much more incentivized to skate around and explore the levels for areas to spray paint and graffiti souls to find. There's also a new collectible called the Mystery Tape, which will unlock and reveal a new graffiti soul in the area after you accomplish a street challenge, like achieving a certain amount of tricks. I'll be honest, this collectible is just kind of whatever to me. It just seems like a middleman that makes finding every graffiti soul more cumbersome than it really needs to be. I feel like if you just replace these mystery tapes with graffiti souls, there would be no love lost. There are a good amount of levels in this game, and each of them are pretty large and have lots of nooks and crannies to explore around in, which you'll be doing a lot of because you'll be returning to each area multiple times and checking out different parts of them as you progress the story. I think that most of the levels, especially the earlier stages, are really good playgrounds to run around in that highlight just how much fun Jet Set Radio Future's gameplay truly is. But there are also some areas that really highlight some of this game's shortcomings, namely the underground sewage facility and the fortified residential zone. These levels feature a lot of grind rails that take you up these very vertical structures, but like I said earlier, when it's really easy to get caught grinding the wrong way, be prepared to fall all the way down these structures, starting you from the bottom with no fast way to get back up to the top. Even if you've unlocked a save point higher up in the level, Jet Set Radio Future is, like its predecessor, very rooted in the time that it came out, in positive ways and in negative ways. One of the negative ways is that this game has no systems for getting around its large, sprawling map conveniently. There's no fast travel, even between save points, which would have been a godsend in the later parts of the game, where you need to travel across the entire city to progress the story, or in the aforementioned times when you fall down a huge vertical structure. This means that you'll be retreading the same ground over and over again just to go and talk to a character only for them to scramble away to another part of the world that you have to go follow. There's one instance in particular where you need to catch this guy, Clutch, but to do this you have to quickly get to one of the areas that he runs away to fast enough or else he'll run away to another part of the map. He cycles through three different extremes of the world that can take a decent amount of time to travel between, so finding him is tedious, boring, and feels like pretty blatant padding done under the guise of making the world feel more interconnected. The other feature that Jet Set Radio Future is sorely lacking is some sort of waypoint system, or at least a marker showing where your next story objective is. DJ Professor K will often give you a line of dialogue at the start of the mission telling you where to go, but if you put this game down for a while and try to come back, there's a very good chance that you'll get lost and have no idea where to go next, which would have been such a simple fix, but unfortunately was also a result of the time that this game came out. These elements of Jet Set Radio Future's open world make it feel very dated and in some ways padded, but I don't think that this makes this game bad by any means. Jet Set Radio also does lose a bit of
of steam towards the end of its runtime. At the beginning, this game is a continuous rush of dopamine, refining and improving upon so much from the original's gameplay, from the light and agile characters to its less rigid and more relaxed structure that doesn't make you retry missions over slight mistakes. You'll also get a taste of some additional mission types or small challenges like defeating the Rokaku police or racing rival gangs or gathering flags, and so much of this is improved and polished compared to how they play in Jet Set Radio. However, towards the back half of its runtime, Jet Set Radio Future starts to focus a lot more on boss battles, having you run back and forth to talk to NPCs and mediocre game modes like Death Ball, which you play three times and it never really gets any better. The boss battles in particular really show the limits of Jet Set Radio Future's tagging mechanics as a combat maneuver, because these bosses are either really boring fights where the strategy is just to wait your turn then attack in the most boring fashion imaginable, or they're so easy and inconsequential that they're over in the blink of an eye. This extra focus on bosses does this game no favors at all, and I really wish that Jet Set Radio Future honed in on its good ideas and its more refined platforming over trying to commit to bosses and extra gameplay styles that halt the game's flow. Jet Set Radio Future is a fast-paced, intricately designed action sport slash platformer, and I personally think it's hard to deny just how polished and smooth this game's controls and gameplay really feel. While I have my criticisms of Future, especially in its later hours, I'm critical because the core gameplay loop here is so good, and if these little issues were addressed, I genuinely think Jet Set Radio Future would be even better than it already is. It's not hard to see why this game has gained a cult following in recent years, and we haven't even really talked about this game's aesthetics yet. Jet Set Radio Future has a very similar style to the first game, but it has completely redesigned characters, and it's just a little bit darker and a little bit grimier to really sell its story and its edge. The levels in particular are a huge standout. While I was impressed with the distinct and interesting levels shown in the first game, Future's levels are so thematically unique and diverse that you can instantly recognize and remember specific areas, but they all fit really well in this cohesive world that doesn't make any area feel out of place. Like, yeah, of course there's an area with pyramids on a rooftop in this game. Why wouldn't there be? And of course, with the new Jet Set Radio game comes a new soundtrack, featuring remixes from the Dreamcast original, new license tracks that reek of their era in the best way possible, and completely new compositions from Hideki Naganuma with that iconic sampling style that are permanently etched into my brain. Check me out, y'all. It's hard to say which soundtrack I prefer because I genuinely love them both a ton. The music to these games fit the style and the tone of these games so perfectly. The style to this game is brilliant, and it's really nice that this game plays at a smooth 60 frames per second compared to its predecessor which is locked to 30 in every version. However, it can be difficult to conveniently play this game nowadays. Jet Set Radio Future was an exclusive on the original Xbox, and it runs best on that console if you're able to play it there. The Xbox 360 is back backwards compatible with this game, which is where the footage you're seeing in this video comes from since I don't have a functioning original Xbox at the moment, but unfortunately the backwards compatibility on Xbox 360 is less than ideal. For the most part, this game is totally playable, but there are a few known glitches in this version that are not present when playing on the original console, like the street names flickering on the menu screen. There's also some extremely noticeable lag, especially in areas like 99th Street and Sky Dinosaurian Square, especially if you use your boost. The the game will slow down to a point where it can be difficult to play. Jet Set Radio Future desperately needs a modern remaster that improves the frame rate and lets us play the game in widescreen so this game can be accessible to people, because more people really should play this game. I understand that this game may be difficult to re-release given the licensed music, but I really think that an HD remaster like the Dreamcast original got would be so fantastic to preserve this game and its legacy, and would make it really easy for people to experience this game that didn't own an original Xbox. 
Xbox. Fixing these technical issues would do wonders for this game and would put its best qualities front and center. Jet Set Radio Future is not a perfect game, but it's undeniably charming. The visuals, sound design, and gameplay are fine-tuned from the Dreamcast original to create a nostalgic feeling experience that is totally worth playing today, if you can. I do miss some of the more arcadey, replayable elements of Jet Set Radio that respect your time but encourage you to return, and even though Future does stumble a bit in its later hours, I still couldn't stop playing until the credits rolled. These games are both brilliant and boundary-pushing games for their time, but unfortunately this duology are really the only mainline games that we've received in the past 20 years. There was a port or demake of the original game on Game Boy Advance, which is very technically impressive, and I respect what they were going for, but it doesn't control the best or hit those same marks that the mainline entries did because it's, you know, on the Game Boy Advance. The Dreamcast original also received the aforementioned HD remaster with widescreen, HD visuals, and a controllable camera, which was great, and this is the way to experience this game. But after this, Jet Set Radio would disappear pretty much entirely, only being relegated to cameos in Sega crossover games. Jet Set Radio's lead designer, Kazuki Hosokawa, did an interview with US Gamer back in 2020 where he mentions how he looks back on Jet Set Radio very fondly, but he doesn't feel that the original team is in a position to create a game like Jet Set Radio again. This was more than 10 years ago, but producer Kawagoe once told us, you guys are too old and experienced to make a new jet. If someone were to create a new jet, it's going to have to be young daredevils like you guys were back then, and I completely agree. However, while he does state that the Jet Set Radio series may not be something he or the original creators feel like they can return to, he also shares his hope for the future of games like Jet Set Radio, stating, If I put it negatively, because of my experience, I can only create games in the smart way. This means that I wouldn't be able to convey that passion in this title that could have only been born through all of the struggles I faced. That's why I'm looking forward to a new generation of creators. It's undeniable that Jet Set Radio was a very influential game, and there are lots of games that have carried on its legacy through adopting its visual style in their own way, pushing cel-shaded graphics forward as a visual style beloved by many in the video game industry today. There are also games like Hover and the upcoming Bomb Rush Cyberfunk that are very obvious homages to Jet Set Radio in pretty much every way that carry its legacy forward. Even if the original creators have not been able to return to Jet Set Radio, many of them have gone on to work on games in the Yakuza series, carrying on that spirit of anti-establishment and moral rebellion in a more mature, slightly less lighthearted way. I did say slightly less. Hosokawa even states that he feels that he wouldn't be where he is today without the experience he gained from Jet Set Radio, which is really heartwarming. Jet Set Radio as a series may be dormant, but its spirit and influence lives on through tons of other works. I just hope that more people get to play these games, and I hope that we see more creative people carrying this series legacy on in their own unique ways, because it deserves to be remembered. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day.